I call the first case on this morning's docket, case number 114589, State of Kansas v. Perez Medina. May it please the court, I'm Heather Cessna with the Appellate Defender Office here on behalf of Mr. Perez Medina, and I would like to request three minutes for rebuttal time, please. Three minutes is granted. Thank you. Just by way of introduction, we are here on the direct appeal from Mr. Perez Medina's jury trial conviction for aggravated battery, so very level four aggravated battery, and the incident underlying that occurred at a party at Mr. Perez Medina's house where the victim in this case, Ivan, ended up with a knife slashed to his cheek that required 12 stitches. Ivan contended that Mr. Perez Medina completely randomly came up to him intentionally and grabbed him from behind and slashed his cheek. Mr. Perez Medina's defense at trial was that this was something less than a knowing and intentional battery, and the jury, however, convicted of the aggravated, so very level four ag battery. The issues that we have on appeal this morning are a question of whether or not Mr. Perez Medina was entitled to reckless lessors on the aggravated battery conviction, and whether or not the deadly weapon finding on the offender registration issue violates Apprendi. So I'll go ahead and start with the first issue, which is the lesser included offense instructions. Just by way of a preliminary issue, the Court of Appeals in this case essentially found that we needed to be under a clearly erroneous standard because they decided that there wasn't a sufficient objection to the judge giving or failing to give the reckless lessors in this case. And our contention is that the conversation that occurred during the jury instructions conference was sufficient to request that instruction and to sort of get us into that slightly better standard as opposed to the clearly erroneous standard. Does that matter if we don't find error? Well, no, Your Honor. It only matters if you do find error. So I think that that was a preliminary finding that the Court of Appeals made in its opinion, and so I wanted to address that first. Of course, if you don't find error, then we don't get to that point at all. But certainly to the extent that the Court of Appeals seems to think that there needed to be some sort of an additional objection here and that the state's argument tries to support that, we would ask respectfully that this court move away from having what we view as an unnecessary procedural hurdle when there was a clear discussion of the request for those instructions below. Moving on to the merits of the issue, obviously for lesser included offenses, the question is whether it's legally and factually appropriate. I don't think that anyone's necessarily contesting whether or not it's legally appropriate as lesser degrees of the same crime. I mean, really the crux of our problem here, I think, is whether or not it's factually appropriate. Certainly the district court found that it was not factually appropriate. The Court of Appeals, I believe, agreed with that contention because the idea here is that there was only sufficient evidence or that there was mainly sufficient evidence of an intentional aggravated battery in this case. And so the argument from the state and that the district court and the Court of Appeals agreed with was that my client wasn't entitled to reckless. Can we explore that, what there was? It seemed to me that the only witness who testified to how the actual cutting occurred was the victim himself. Right. No one else saw it. They could assume that there was a cutting because they saw bleeding afterward and they saw him holding the knife beforehand, but there was no one who actually saw it happen who testified, right? That is correct, Your Honor. The only other thing was the inconsistent testimony from the one person who was on the scene who said initially that something happened and then later that there had been a fight. Right. My client's wife testified that that other witness had told her that there had been a disagreement prior to the actual incident. And there was also evidence that my client had difficulty gripping a knife because of a prior incident and that he had some wounds on his hands that indicated that there had potentially been something more than what Ivan himself had testified to occurred. Certainly, we don't... He had been drinking enough that he needed to be helped into the home. Right. And at that point, there is some 
I will admit that there is, it's not clear how much he had been drinking up until that point. Certainly my client's wife indicated he had been drinking quite a bit. By the time the police came and arrested him later, he vomited himself on himself in the police car, although that was after how, Mr. How long are we talking about between the time of the events and the time he's in the police I don't car? know that the record's entirely clear about that, Your okay. Honor. So, um, so the most that you have to support anything looking like reckless is what exactly? It's definitely this one uh, really pushes the envelope. I think. I, I think I think that it it still falls on this side, Your Honor. And the Cou reason, Counselor, bef before you tell us what facts support reckless, can we nail down what is reckless? Because I think that's the foundational problem here that we get talking past each other when we're uh, talking. Was it recklessly cutting? because he's charged with knowingly causing great bodily harm or disfigurement. Mm -hmm. And so he's saying he recklessly caused great bodily harm or disfigurement. And we get hung up talking about, did he cut him uh, on purpose or by accident? But aren't we talking about the recklessness is in the causing of great bodily harm, right? You're, you're correct, Your Honor. I mean, I believe that the uh, in the definition of the reckless under 5202J, I think it is, uh, indicates that there's a, a knowledge that there's a risk there and that it's a disregard of that risk. So, um, so with that in mind, let's go back to my colleague's question. What facts are there that he was reckless in causing great bodily harm? Um, I think, and this is what defense counsel was arguing below, is that there was evidence that he um, had been handling the knife when he was intoxicated, that he certainly knew, um, as the state argued from his previous experience as a meat cutter, that you know handling a dangerous object like that would be problematic. Um, There's some indication that there was a disrespectful behavior on Mr. or on Ivan's part that the defense counsel argued was circumstantial evidence that there was potentially a confrontation of some sort well, that had led. That, what difference does that make? I think because you spent. I think you spent a lot of effort on the fact that there might have been an argument. I, but I don't understand how that factors into this. I think the problem is, is that we don't know if the. I mean, certainly there was direct evidence that Ivan said that the slash to his face was intentional, but but. Given the circumstances that were otherwise testified to, and that when you look at the lessers in the light most favorable to the defense, I think there are circumstances there that a jury could have found that 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 the actual cutting to the face maybe didn't happen as an intentional or a knowing cutting, but that it occurred in the context of some kind of a confrontation. And because of the defensive wounds or potentially defensive wounds on my client's part, um, that would lead to support that. There are you kind of inference stacking by the time you get done? I don't we think always, we're... We always kind of fly spec the state's case for inference stacking. What about the defense case? I, I guess my response to that is that if you look at it from sort of the alternate perspective, I mean, if my client had been convicted of reckless aggravated battery under these circumstances and we were trying to argue that there was insufficient evidence of that, I don't know that we could have. Um, and I mean, certainly as a defense counsel, we would have tried, but um, but I don't know that we could have successfully argued that under these circumstances because even the gravest of of uh, convictions can be upheld by circumstantial evidence. And so, and in that sense, when you turn it back around, then and you look at whether or not there was sufficient evidence to support the giving of the lesser. Um, in this case, our argument is that that same circumstantial evidence should justify the giving of the lesser, so that the jury has that option. You're saying all of those things show a disregard of the risk? Is that is that, that your he point? Because it, it seems like you set up that he had knowledge of the risk his, with his experience, work experience. So um, I, I'm just trying to still figure out how your argument fits into that definition of recklessness. Yeah, I mean, I think that it requires a, I think it requires a reasonable inference, which the jury is allowed to make, that the actual cutting itself um, was the result of, of essentially, you know, brandishing a knife when everybody was intoxicated and there was some kind of confrontation going on. And that that does require that the jury disbelieve Ivan's testimony to a certain extent. Um, but I think that the standards for giving the lesser, you know, even if that evidence is contested, even if it's not, you know, doesn't rise to a you know, very convincing level, it's still, there's a relatively low threshold that we need to reach there. And I think 
our argument is that we sufficiently reach that here. And I wrote down three things. Is that, is that the list as to the evidence of, of uh, recklessness? I've got him handling slash mishandling a knife. I've got him drunk and I've got a disrespectful conduct by the victim causing a fight. And I, I mean, there's other there's other factors that weigh into sort of the circumstances surrounding that, which is that he was uh, showed up at this party that he wasn't invited to. There was some allegation, I believe, that he was asked to leave and didn't, although he denied that. Uh, and obviously, some of that evidence is contested, but we would argue that it meets that minimum threshold. So he was an uninvited guest. Anything else? That's what we have here. You had mentioned something about wounds on his hands. Yeah, um, yes, he had some wounds on his hands. Um, I believe at least one wound on each side that was some indication that there may have been something else that, that went on. I'm sorry, I didn't. if you didn't already have that on your list, I would add that to your list. Well, I had a and, fight. Yeah. And the disability is pre-existing and is supposed to have been in the hand that the victim says he used to slash him. If, if the, if the um, incident happened the way that the victim described where he came up behind him and slashed him, then it would have had to have been in that right hand, which would have been a disability. Okay. Counsel, my, my confusion is why do we get to all these nuanced discussions of the facts when, at least arguably, as a matter of law, a sufficient proof of a higher degree of culpability is also sufficient proof of a lower degree of mental culpability. Well, and that's one of the reasons why we filed our 609 letter in this case was after listening to this court's discussion in Chavez. One of the cases that the state relies on in its um, supplemental briefing was arrear, and I believe there was some question as to whether or not because of that statutory language arrear is even good law anymore. And of course, arrear is the case where uh, where this sort of same situation happened, where there was a reckless uh, conviction and then they successfully argued on appeal that uh, there was only evidence of intentional and therefore there was insufficient evidence of reckless. And then in you know, uh, the legislature added that new language in the statute, I believe between the Court of Appeals a decision and the well, Supreme right. Court decision in this case, in that and, case. And if our test for the giving of an LIO is essentially a sufficiency test, which is what this court sa has said. Um, would it be true that that statute renders the evidence here sufficient just as a matter of law and logic, given I, the proof of knowing? I would argue that it does, Your Honor. Um, I certainly think that we should be able to prevail even on the facts themselves, but uh, if there's you know, it would be easier for you to that. prevail if it was just a question of law, right? It would be, Your Honor. However, I will admit that that was not an argument that we presented below. So <laughs> I think the, the application of that statute, however, uh, depending on how this court interprets that uh, in Chavez, I think it have some rippling effects on cases like this one and certainly would apply on direct appeal. Um, and our argument would be that that does create a sufficient factual basis as a matter of law to give lessers um, that maybe perhaps could be rebutted in certain situations. I mean, I could see a case where where a defendant comes in and says, no, every, all the evidence is that this was intentional. I intended to cause this harm. Maybe it's because I have some kind of, um, some kind of, of uh, defense that, you know, the other person was being the first aggressor or self-defense issue. But, but can't but, the jury decide that it was reckless? I mean, what we're talking about is whether they give it. I don't think it causes a problem with uh, uh, the, the other way, that if the jury said, no, it was just reckless, it wasn't knowing, uh, then they would convict of the lesser. But what we're talking about is whether there's evidence, some evidence, and when we're talking about the uh, culpable mental state, what my colleague is saying is if the state is alleging sufficient evidence for knowing, then by definition they're also alleging sufficient evidence of reckless, so then the jury, the jury gets to choose. And, and I think that that certainly applies um, in this case. I, I think that 
that under either a straight factual analysis or under 5202C, I think that the district court had a duty to give the instruction in this case. Ultimately, whether or not this court uh, believes that failure to give that is harmless um, is a question that would be affected by how this court determines that initial question of whether or not we've sufficiently objected to this or not. And our argument would be that it, it is uh, harmful in this case for the obvious reasons that it sort of negates the defense's entire theory of defense by failing to give it because his whole theory of defense was not necessarily that he didn't cause the wound, but that it was something less than what the state had charged as the knowing battery. And so I think that that had a substantial effect on my client's defense in this case by not being able to get that reckless uh, instructions at the end. Um, I see I'm out of time. May I have just one second to, or maybe five seconds to, to uh, uh, wrap up just briefly, Your Honor? I'll even give you 20 seconds. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> You're very generous. Um, just as far as the second issue is concerned, uh, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge that obviously uh, since the petition was filed in this case, this court came down with Huey. Um, we would argue that Huey's wrongly decided for the same reasons that Justice Beyer and uh, Johnson issued in their dissents in Huey and Meredith and uh, in Perez, or I'm sorry, in uh, Peterson Beard, uh, but I will acknowledge that we don't have anything particularly different about this case to accept it out of that um, that decision. So we would ask that this court find that the failure to give the lessers in this case was um, reversible error and ask that this court remand it back for a new trial. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. May it please the court, uh, Chris Hillslager, appearing on behalf of the state. <clears throat> um, as an initial matter, uh, the state believes that the Court of Appeals was correct in that uh, this uh, the jury instruction issue was not properly preserved, and so the, the standard of review is clear error. Uh, defense counsel below did not make any affirmative request for the reckless instruction, did not object uh, when the district court announced it was not going to give it. So, how, Excuse me, counsel. How, do you have any idea how much time we're talking about before? between the instructions conference and the reading of the instructions to the jury? Because your point is that there should have been an objection at the time they were read to or immediately after. Yes, but no, I, I don't know how much time there was, but I know when the, when the judge said, he said, I'm not gonna give it. At that point, defense counsel did not lodge an objection to preserve the issue. Um, and, and you don't think this case is closer to Gatlin than? <clears throat> well, I think that and the distinction I made in the brief in Gatlin is that in, in Gatlin, defense counsel affirmatively requested the instruction, which didn't happen here. Ahead of time. And, ahead of time. And he made two separate um, affirmative requests for that, uh, for that instruction. Because here, uh, the, the defense counsel was rather passive. Uh, the judge brought it up, and the and defense counsel said, well, Judge, since you brought it up, yeah, I think that's a good idea. But then after they discussed it, the judge said, no, I'm not going to give it. And defense counsel said nothing more. Uh, so I think uh, he, he failed to properly preserve the issue, so the standard should be clear error. And the point of requiring objections, which we often say, is to allow the district court to consider the issue and avoid trying a case with... Uh, uh, reversible error and yes. was that was that purpose accomplished here when it was brought up and discussed and the court was made aware uh, that the defense was in favor of it uh, and was fully discussed so how, how is it the purpose of the objection met here not entirely because at the end of the discussion when the defense counsel didn't didn't lodge an objection he uh, I think essentially acquiesced into it. So from the judge's point of view, it seemed like everybody was in agreement that the uh, the instruction was not necessary. Counsel did not make clear that he felt that it was necessary and that it would be an error not to give it. Uh, so I think he he acquiesced in the uh, uh, in the giving of the instruction. I mean he and, and certainly waived. I, I think he waived because he didn't he didn't object. Um, it's, I mean there is. I mean there's a requirement for for an objection and. It, it, we need to draw the line somewhere so it's clear. Um, if we start to, to veer away from that too much, then I think we'll get into the realm where we'll never be quite sure if an issue is preserved or not. Uh, so I think when the, when the judge announces, I'm not going to give it at that point, it, there at least at that point, there should be clear, uh, a clear statement by defense counsel that he disagrees and thinks that it, it should be given. Um, regardless, though, this, the, 
this case comes down to the, the facts and whether the court believes that the facts in this case warrant a reckless instruction or not. Um, the district court didn't believe so and the Court of Appeals didn't believe so. I think they were correct. I mean, the, all the facts here indicate that this man came up behind the victim, grabbed him, <clears throat> grabbed his head, put a knife to his face and slashed his face. Why do we, why do we get to the facts um, when we have 21-5202? Uh, because I still believe the facts matter. I mean, the facts have to match. I mean, the... why, what, well, why? Why do they matter if 5502 says proof, sufficient proof of the higher degree of cul mental culpability um, equates with, as a matter of law, is sufficient proof of the lesser? And we have, and you would concede, we have sufficient proof of the higher. That's what the defendant was convicted of. Yeah. Well, I think that's that. And that provision was put in, it was originally recommended by the Recodification Committee. And uh, I have to admit I was part of that committee at the, at the very end. Um, and I think... Uh, I so think we that, can blame you? You know, in hindsight, I wish I had... You know, there, there are some reasons for the, uh, for the way they restructured the, the uh, mental state. Uh, it, it was decided before I, I was a substitute to that committee. But when they explained it to me, I thought, yeah, that makes sense. But now... In hindsight, <laughs> may have it, 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 maybe it doesn't. Uh, the idea was that look, if the state, if, if if you have these different mental states, and one of them is the most difficult to to, to prove, I mean, the thought was well, logically, yeah, they it's must the, have proven it's the China doll thing. Yeah, and they nest inside one another. What what people didn't consider, I mean, with intentional and knowing, that makes sense. But with recklessness, it doesn't always make sense because sometimes the facts the facts diverge to where it's the mental states contrary be, to our prior it, law. That right. said recklessness they, and intentional. They would be right. almost exclusive. I mean, sometimes the facts indicate that but it's our, one or the other. But our problem is the plain language of the statute. I mean, we don't typically look but, and look behind that and say. And, but the and issue the, is, and is, the problem goes beyond just the language, just the way it's been argued to us. Because when uh, the f defendants would, if it had been uh, convicted of reckless, and said no, it was intentional. I, I wasn't reckless, it was intentional. The states argue, would argue 5202C, it doesn't matter. And, and we've had prosecutors argue to us that it doesn't really matter whether it was reckless if they proved knowing or intentional. So, so it's not just theoretical, it's, it's been argued to us that way too. But I think, again, the facts matter because I think you'll get some fact patterns where there simply couldn't be <laughs> reckless conduct, where it could only be intentional or knowing conduct. But that requires us to ignore the statute. I mean, you're conceding that. Basically. I don't think it requires you to ignore the statute. I think it requires you to apply logic to the statute. You have to apply the, law, the statute to the facts. But otherwise, what you're going to end up with is a per se rule that in every criminal case you must give. That's what, that's what the statute says. It, it's a per se rule. I don't, or help me understand how I could read it any other way. Well, it, I, I know it wasn't intended to be a per se rule. It was simply to be a, a, a catch-all for if you know, if the state had had gone so far as to prove the more difficult uh, uh, mental state that then they necessarily had proven the, the lesser mental state. But I think the facts still matter. If you get facts where it would be mutually exclusive to where you could not have reckless conduct, you could only have intentional conduct or vice versa, then those are the instructions you give. The instructions still have to match the facts. Otherwise, I mean, otherwise, then yes, then the rule is you must always give reckless uh, instructions regardless of whether there's any evidence to support it or not, which is not the law. It has not been our case law. Um, and I think when you look at the facts here, there, there's no evidence of, of that. All of the evidence points to, to uh, intentional conduct. And when you look at the definition of, of reckless, you know, a person acts recklessly or is reckless when such a person, uh, such a person consciously disregards a substantial and unjustifiable risk that circumstances exist or that a result will follow, and such disregard constitutes a gross deviation from the standard of care which a reasonable person would exercise in the situation. I mean, what what is the standard of care when you come up behind somebody and, and put a knife to their face? I mean, that there is no standard of care for that because that's just an intentional act. There's, that's an intentional intent to harm. There's no recklessness involved. There could be no recklessness involved. So then you, you have an, an illogical and, and factually unsupportable instruction if you were to give a reckless instruction. And so, so you're asking us to. I'm asking what, you to apply the statute the law. away. Is there an ambiguity? I mean, applying our rules of statutory construction to 5202, <laughs> is, are you arguing that it's ambiguous? 
Well, I believe it certainly it is ambiguous, and I think you have to apply the law to the facts. I mean, the facts still matter. Uh, Your argument is it's ambiguous, and we should look to the more concrete and specific definitions of knowing and reckless as a way to um, construe these statutes together to make them make sense from your perspective. Well, certainly I want you to construe the statute so they make sense. <laughs> I mean, that you, you want to avoid absurd results. I mean, I believe that's a, that's a rule of statutory construction as well. And I think you would get absurd results when, if you insist that every case you must have a recklessness instruction uh, regardless of whether the facts fit it or not. It just, that doesn't make any sense. And that would be an absurd result. Why, why is this absurd? In this particular case, if you say, well, the facts are such that the, any rational jury sh should, should find knowing, I think was the uh, uh, mental state involved here, uh, then the rational juror, jury will just uh, convict of the principal crime. But if they're convinced that it was reckless under that definition, then they can uh, convict of the lesser. And how is, it, how is it absurd to let a jury decide what the facts mean when they're given the law and the facts and they decide? Because that's kind of the system. And well, but then why don't we just, just take the whole pick instruction, the whole book of pick instructions and give them to the jury and say, you guys figure it out. I mean, you have to, the judge is there for a reason. He has to figure, he has to instruct the jury on the law that applies to the facts. I mean, otherwise, you could say, well, let's go ahead and give them the first degree murder instruction, and let's give them the burglary instruction, and let's give them the, the battery instruction, even though none of those fact patterns match the facts that have been presented uh, in, the, in the case, but let, the, let them figure it out. I mean, there has to be some guidance to the jury, and where if there is no rational basis for a, for a recklessness instruction, the judge, it's his job to, to give the correct instructions. But that's, I, I understand your uh, argument on to the extreme, but what we're talking about here is the culpable mental state. What was in the defendant's head. And that has to be decided by circumstances. And we've already talked, well, here, here's these facts, and here are these facts, and here are these facts. Let's, let's decide if they are circumstances that would uh, uh, imply uh, a knowing act or an intentional act, or a reckless act. And why isn't that a jury question then when we're, we're, we're here debating on what these facts mean? Well, I think there still has to be some minimal evidence that would support that. We, there's no evidence from the defendant and, of what was in his head. And what's your basis for that? Because our statute says if there's some evidence upon which the jury could reasonably convict, but the, there's no evidence here where a jury could reasonably find uh, reckless conduct. Uh, that's my position. There's no evidence of, of reckless conduct. All of the evidence is intentional conduct. Now, had the defendant taken the stand and said, you know, I, I was waving the knife around wildly, I didn't mean to hurt anybody, well, then you might have that. But you don't have that evidence. The only evidence you have is the victim saying, look, he grabbed me from behind and he slashed my face with the knife. And I think all of us applying common sense to that can go, that, that can only be an intentional act. That's not reckless. That's intentional. You don't, you don't walk up uh, right up behind somebody, grab them by the head, pull their head back, and slash uh, recklessly. That just isn't possible. Well, it, am I wrong? I thought he was charged with uh, ag battery of knowingly causing great bodily harm. And knowingly is different than intent. Well, okay, yeah, I'm, you're, you're well I mean, really. We, I mean, it, we've got this mess here we have to deal with, and, and we have to be a little more precise, don't we? Yeah, he, he, he knew what he was doing, is, is my point. He, he made an, an intentional act, a knowing act, a willful act uh, to, uh, to, to cut the victim's face. That's all the evidence we have. That's why the judge declined to give the recklessness instruction, and, that's, and he was correct. And I submit that the Court of Appeals was correct. Uh, there just isn't any basis for a recklessness instruction, and I think you have to construe the law to make to make sense. The facts still matter, and under these facts, there was no there was no basis for a recklessness instruction. Um, and ultimately, I mean that's that's where I stand, and, and uh, I can say no more about it uh, other than that. And I would ask the court to to affirm the district court and the court of appeals. Uh, in finding that there was no clear error in failing to give that instruction. 
Well, I know you've made the general statement that uh, this act was intentional, or as Justice Johnson pointed out, it was done knowingly. knowingly. Could you address the points that opposing counsel raised as to why an instruction should have been given? Justice Biles was <clears throat> reciting some of those reasons. It was the handling of the knife, he was drunk, disrespectful conduct before this happened, he was an uninvited guest, cuts on the hand, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, I heard all of that, and none of that seemed to be evidence of recklessness. In fact, it seems to cut the other way. I mean, the, if you know, an uninvited guest who uh, maybe irritated the, the defendant and, and uh, started the confrontation. Again, that, that indicates a knowing act on the part of the, uh, the defendant, not, not a reckless act, that he knowingly was angry at this guy, didn't want him there, and, and, and was out to get him. Um, and, and as far as the, the drunkenness goes, I mean, he, I, I don't recall if he asked for a voluntary intoxication instruction or not, but well, that's, that's conflating the, the intoxication defense with recklessness, I think. Um, but overall, all, all of the facts that the opposing counsel uh, suggested to me either indicate or are, are indicators of reckless conduct or, the, or, I'm sorry, of intentional knowing conduct, or they just simply aren't, they don't go either way, but they're certainly not indicators of reckless conduct. I mean, there's nothing in what she described that would show a, a uh, <coughs> conscious disregard um, for, for the risk uh, I mean, the fact that the guy was an uninvited guest and started a confrontation, to me, that indicates that, I think that's a strong indication more of a, of a knowing act rather than any kind of a reckless act. Thank you, counsel. If there are no any more questions? Any further presentation? No, Your Honor, we ask that the court affirm the, the lower court. Thank you very much. Thank you, counsel. May it please the court, I just wanted to take the opportunity to answer a couple of the questions that were asked of opposing counsel. Uh, Justice Byer, By Byer, you asked uh, about the timing of the instructions conference. I believe that happened immediately after, uh, the actual giving of the instructions occurred immediately after the instructions conference. There was the discussion about the reckless lessers, and then there was a little bit of a discussion about a couple other instructions, and then they went directly into the reading of the instructions to the jury. Um, Justice Steele, you asked about the whether or not the facts matter, and you know our argument obviously is that if the facts do matter, we should win. Uh, but if they don't, um, under fifty two hundred two, our argument is that that's you know precisely what the statute says, and that that's the well, precisely what the statute says is <coughs> proof of a higher degree of culpability than that charge constitutes proof of culpability of the charged crime. That's what it says. Isn't it talking about what is charged and the state of mind of what is charged? Not anything to do with lessers. Is that if you prove the higher state, then it suffices for the crime charge? We don't get into lesser included on that statute, do we? Well, and I think I think my isn't, isn't that part of part of has to be part of. <coughs> The, uh, I think I mean that's one of the reasons. Here. I'm sorry, I didn't mean no, to. No, that's right. Uh, I think that's one of the reasons why we went ahead and six and nine to, uh, green was because I think that there is a little bit of a concern about statutory language, and the court of appeals addressed that in that case. Um, I think my response to that is that uh, whenever you are charged with the whatever you are charged with, automatically incorporates as part of it all of the lessers. That's why there's not a notice problem with that. That's why there's not a um, so anytime, not, anytime a crime is charged by this statute, and your reading of the statute is then, doesn't matter what there's there any factual determinations in terms of there, there's no cutoff, basically, all the lessers for state of mind. And I, I just don't read it that way because it talks about the crime charge and its culpability for that crime, not the lesser crime. Well, and I guess, and like I said, I think that I think that inherently sort of calls into question what we what we intend when we have lessers. I mean, if those are part of the original crime, and that's why we don't have notice problems with lessers. That's why we don't have. That's why they essentially automatically carry, and they don't have to be charged in the alternative. Uh, those are then that I think problem is um, a, a language issue with the statute that doesn't actually have a practical effect on the outcome of the argument that the that the actual language requires this sort of legal fiction. I, I understand your your argument that about the crime charged incorporating the lessers. Do you have to go there when you have the second sentence of the statute, I, which just says, if recklessness suffices to establish an element, the element is also established if a person acts knowingly. 
Well, certainly if there's a conflict between those two things, I think the rule of lenity requires that it be read in favor of the defendant. So that, that leads to my question, which was earlier when we were talking about this, you indicated that there might be circumstances, you, I think you called it where, I think you used the word rebut, where, you, where the facts might rebut this presumption in the statute. So that leads me to my question, do you agree with the state's proposition that this statute may produce absurd results? Um, that would be a, arguably an absurd result if, if someone was left trying to rebut I don't, statute. I don't know I don't know that I would call it an absurd result. I think the legislature can create this legal fiction and say that as a matter of law that these things are all going to be considered factually appropriate so you think it's, create this statute. Your argument is it's not absurd for the legislature to say as a matter of law this item you know A has been proved even though Everyone knows that A has not been proved. Well, that it's not absurd. I don't think it's absurd, Your Honor, and I think it's because this court has, in other contexts, sort of in the opposite view, already approved of the legislature doing essentially just that. I think of specifically the lesser included offense or, um, uh, wording in the felony murder statute. They, I mean, we all know this court's already found that there are, you know, legally and factually appropriate lesser included offenses of felony murder, and the legislature has come out and said. We're creating this legal fiction that those do not exist. And so we, and this court's approved of that. I mean, I think that the legislature can come in and say, if they can say in that sort of circumstance that those lesser included don't exist, I don't see how it's any different for them to come in and say these do under that statutory language. Any further questions? Any? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, counsel. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.